This video introduces Yeats, The Second Coming, as a modernist poem, as well as perhaps a work with ties to Romanticism and Shelley's Frankenstein. Modernism is an artistic response to the promise and failure of modernity. Yeats, The Second Coming, is one such response. It was written in 1919, on the heels of both the Easter Rising, World War I, and the Communist Revolution in Russia, events which Yeats interpreted in terms of his grand vision of the history of civilizations, with its image of the gyre as a representation of how civilizations are doomed from their inception to be destroyed from both within and without. The image of a gyre connotes how, at its inception, a civilization is tight, strong, and cohesive, and how, as time goes by and the gyre turns and widens, the civilization moves towards spiraling out of control. The title reflects Yeats's focus on Judeo-Christian civilization. For Christians, the second coming refers to the end of the world when Jesus returns to earth, judging the living and the dead. Yeats riffs on this concept from a secular perspective. The Christian doctrine of the second coming shows how Christianity itself, from the start, foresaw the end of human life on earth. But in Yeats's poetic account of history, the end isn't exactly what Christians had in mind. Yeats' second coming refers not so much to the return of a figure at the heart of Christian civilization, but rather the arrival of a new order that will destroy and supplant the old Christian order. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming, hardly are those words out, when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs, while all around it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. In true modernist fashion, through its representation of a society breaking up and spinning out of control, the poem powerfully evokes the experience of living during a time when the failures of modernity are viscerally evident. I've stressed how societies understand and order themselves through systems and dualisms that clean up and organize what is in reality a messy world. One way of understanding Yeats' reference to how mere anarchy is loosed upon the world and the blood-dimmed tide is loosed is as a reference to the dissolution of a European Christian order. Anarchy, of course, is the opposite of organization, and blood-dimmed tide is a rich phrase that may suggest an abject, bloody engulfment or drowning of an existing social order. The final two lines of the stanza suggest how the dissolution of European civilization and the, the idea of the human on which that society is based is occurring from within it. The best lack all conviction, that is the most intelligent and perceptive members of the society, having witnessed horrors like World War I, no longer follow the beliefs and practices of their culture. While someone like Mary Shelley's father, William Godwin, fervently believed that man and society could be perfected, the best and wisest members of Yeats' world lack that confidence about the self and society. It is only the worst members of society, the least perceptive, and perhaps most 
dangerous and ill-meaning people who are full of passionate intensity regarding themselves and their world. The second stanza emphasizes not the dissolution of a civilization from within, but the new alternate social order that is destroying it from without. We've devoted much of our energies in this class to the oppressive effects of a European social system on women, peasants, or commoners, and non-Europeans. In other words, the idea of changing things up could be quite wonderful, liberating, and exciting. Yeats, however, portrays this alternate world through the image of a monster who, in keeping with the workings of abjection, violates the binary of human and animal with its head of a man and its lion body, and whose slow thighs suggest a terrifyingly relentless, inevitable movement, and whose gaze blank and pitiless suggests an utter unconcern and disregard for the civilization it's replacing. Yeats' modernist image here may have its origin in Shelley's monster. Technically, we'd call Shelley a romantic. Romanticists, like modernists, were concerned with rapid changes happening in their modern world, like the French Revolution. Poets like Mary's husband, Percy, tended to evoke their sense of horror over such changes through feelings of sadness and melancholia. But perhaps Shelley's creature suggests how she is also proto-modernist, and conversely, how Yeats is a romantic. After all, the creature is a powerful, oversized being with eyes uncannily like Yeats, rough beast, and whose image troubles the vision of Victor in the same way that the rough beast troubles the speaker's vision in Yeats's poem. You are welcome to generate a two-page, double-spaced, and typed close reading of this poem. Among the questions you might consider are, how does a rhetoric of the sublime emerge in the poem through words like vast? How does the poem engage the abject? Consider, for example, trouble, whose meanings include the following. How does Yeats theory of the gyre come through in the poem. For example, through words like loosed and real, whose meanings are given here. 